Ashish brother, can you pray with her? Okay, thank you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Almighty, Abba Father, uh, we thank you for your grace, love, and mercy towards us. We especially thank for your guidance and providence. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And we especially thank for this uh, wonderful online meeting that we have uh, encouraged to see our dear brother Rick. And we particularly pray for uh, today's subject about two feedings, that there are contradistinctions between these two feedings. There are particular distinctions and differences, and they have different interpretations. Lord, we ask for your guidance of your Holy Spirit to enlighten us, admonish us, uplift us as we hear today's message. Be with the speaker, Brother Rick, to explain us, to expound the scriptures loudly and slowly. Be with us all and bind us in one accord of love. In your Holy Son, Jesus' name, in our returned Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, uh, uh, we thank everybody for uh, joining for today's class. Uh, before going through the class, uh, I would like to introduce Brother Rick uh, to all of you. Uh, probably, I think uh, this is the first time uh, many of the brothers and sisters are seeing Brother Rick. Brother Rick, uh, his full name is uh, Richard Cunningham. So, uh, and uh, he's a wonderful brother. He's a consecrated brother for more than uh, many years. Uh, uh, I've been in the truth uh, since uh, 24 years, uh, but uh, when I was a kid, almost a teenager, I have been seeing him. He's a well-dedicated brother who lives in the uh, U.S. Uh, and uh, he's a brother who is very zealous for the Lord and uh, who supports a lot, a lot of uh, harvest activity all over the world, especially to the brethren in India. Uh, we have been very grateful to God for giving us a wonderful brother, who has been supplying all the books, almost all the English literature, whatever we have in India. Uh, it's by God's grace that God has used Brother Rick to supply these materials. And probably some of the materials Brother has sent to Brother Ashish and Brother Gopal. In future, we'll be sending many more to the brethren. And uh, he's also one of the tools uh, to organize the funds uh, to support uh, our uh, Nepal Ecclesia, the Kathmandu Ecclesia, and our uh, regular trips to uh, Kathmandu also and the harvest activity uh, in Kathmandu and uh, especially in various places in uh, Karnataka and India also. So we thank the Lord for giving such a wonderful brother and uh, giving him a good and a wonderful heart to support uh, the brethren who are in need. So uh, we thank uh, uh, all these things. And uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, request Brother Cunningham to tell a little bit of few words about himself so that everybody understand uh, uh, more about uh, uh, him. Then we will uh, introduce one by one the Nepali brethren. Uh, then we will uh, go to the subject. Uh, over to Brother Rick. Thank you, Brother Raju. And thank you, Brethren in Nepal, for this opportunity to be with you. Not quite face to face but the next best thing via Zoom. And uh, we thank Brother Raju for his very kind words, much appreciated. And it's true, all glory goes to our Heavenly Father. Uh, if we've been a useful tool in his hand, we are thankful for that. Uh, I... I consecrated in 1978. I was searching for the truth. I had been raised a Presbyterian. I left that as a young teenager, recognizing that the spirit of, of true Christianity was not there. But I searched many different 
religions for a few years. Uh, but constantly my prayer was to, to come to know God. And he did lead me to a, a brother who told me about the truth. And I was immersed in 1978. <clears throat> my wife and I married in 1981. And she is a third generation Bible student. Her parents and her grandparents are both consecrated on both her father and her mother's side. She consecrated when she was a teenager at age 14. My first trip to India was 1984. And I came with a brother from Vancouver Island, Canada, Brother Brent Hislop. We spent three weeks traveling throughout India, meeting different brethren. Traveling in India in 1984 is much different than traveling today. However, we found that the brethren were desirous of having the truth literature and they needed books, and they wanted to print truth literature in their own language, mostly Tamil, but some Karnataka and some uh, Marathi for the brethren that were in Bombay at that time. And eventually, it spread to other uh, Indian states and uh, Malayalam and uh, Hindi, and um, I'm forgetting the language for Andhra Pradesh. Telugu. Telugu, thank you. So that the truth has been printed in most of those languages, but Tamil and Karnataka uh, most completely. But that being said, we've made eight trips to India. My wife, uh, Sister Ruth, joined me on two of those trips, our last one in 2019. But we have seen how the truth has spread exponentially, marvelously, in the last 20, 25 years throughout India. And through the efforts of the Indian brethren, um, into Nepal, of course, and Myanmar, and uh, Sri Lanka, and Singapore, as well as other countries. Because, in part, because Indians travel out of the country for work. And they then take the truth with them, or since the advent of the internet and the advanced media, uh, social media methods, Zoom, WhatsApp, YouTube, these different Indians outside of living outside of India have been able to find the truth in their own language, Tamil, Canada, such. And then they introduce it in their countries. So, we have brethren in Dubai, Bahrain, even a sister in Iraq, Malaysia, and Solomon Islands. Last Saturday evening, my time, Sunday morning, their time, we we had a, a, a worship service and a study in the brethren in Solomon Islands via Zoom. Very marvelous. So we are very grateful to see how the Lord is calling more particularly now, last, I'll say, 30 years, from India and the surrounding countries um, of a uh, Asia and Southeast Asia and the Pacific and uh, somewhat in Africa, the truth is still going forth in Europe and in North America. It's true, but there is not the same reception uh, as there is in these 
former countries I mentioned. So we're very thankful to see it and we rejoice very much. And uh, we're very thankful for you brethren in uh, Nepal. In our class, Oakland County Bible students, where we meet, we have elections every year, January. We have three elders currently and three deacons. And we have four different studies a week. We have a, a study in volume one, a study in volume five, study in the Revelation, and a study in uh, the book of Matthew. And we have a testimony meeting. I guess that makes five meetings, a testimony meeting every week. And our average attendance with Zoom, some within the class, some without, our meetings might average as many as, as 30. Uh, but um, uh, regardless, the smaller the size of a class, perhaps the brethren can be more involved in participating in the studies. So you brethren in Nepal, while we're so grateful for the newly consecrated, as well as the ones uh, from the beginning, Brother Ashish, and then, then Brother Gopal, you are in a excellent position to have very profitable studies together now. So your efforts to understand and prove God's truth from the divine plan of the ages to yourself, each of you individually. That is the best thing you can be doing. And then as you learn it and are convinced of it, then you have a greater ability to share it with others when you have opportunity. So with that, that's our our little part. Um, I'll, I'll say that I'm 68 years old. I probably look older, but I am 68. And I'm uh, very thankful to the Lord that we can be with you today. Over. Thank you, Brother Rick. Uh, Brother, uh, Brother Rick just old, he's 68 years old, but he's very zealous and uh, very young and very, very, very zealous. Uh, to be uh, to be frank, uh, my experience with uh, uh, Brother abroad uh, is that uh, Brother Rick, uh, uh, Lord has used him to give us uh, healthy and wonderful uh, messages uh, which helps us to walk ahead in a narrow way walk of life, uh, which helps us to face the trials. So uh, that is one of the uh, advantages which uh, God has given us through Brother Rick. Uh, we thank you, Brother, for sharing your testimony. And I request to one by one, Brethren, as I call on the name, to tell about themselves uh, in just a few minutes to Brother Rick, uh, one by one, as I call on the name. Initially, you can on the video uh, because in Nepal, uh, there is not a greater bandwidth as we use it in all over the world. So if you can on the video for a few moments and just show your uh, uh, face to Brother Rick, uh, it will be very uh, kind of you, Brother. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, uh, Sister Romy. Uh, Sister Romy, uh, can you introduce yourself to Brother Rick? Can you just on the video, sister, if you don't mind? Okay, okay. Jai Masi. Jai Masi, sister. Uh, uh, my name is Romy. Uh, I'm so honored to be with you all, as always, uh, every week. And uh, especially today, introducing myself. Um, um, I am sister-in-law of uh, Gopal, Brother Gopal, and I have just, sorry, uh, I have a little cutie around here. Um, I have just completed my plus two, and uh, I'm so grateful uh, about knowing the truth through Gopal, and it's been almost a year. Um, and 
I feel very, very thankful to the Lord and uh, to all the people around um, uh, who have been involved in uh, sharing the truth. Especially, I want to thank Brother Lazu as well because Brother, I have been so able to uh, know a lot of things through you. I'm not catching things. And uh, recently, uh, our family uh, uh, get opportunity to uh, get uh, immersion, and it's been almost a month. And um, I have been praying for the. Um, work like where I can feed myself uh, for sharing the truth and all. Uh, for now, I would like to end up here and anything that uh, specific, uh, if I'm forgetting anything, kindly let me know. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, sister. Uh, sister uh, is a wonderful sister, brother. Uh, she is very zealous in the Lord. And uh, sister uh, doesn't hesitate to ask any questions. Sir. She openly <laughs> and frankly uh, puts her questions in front of everybody, whether we like it or not. <laughs> but uh, we usually appreciate uh, those questions because uh, those things uh, brings uh, what actually is there in her heart and gives us uh, more opportunity to bring forth the truth a more clarity way. And she's got a wonderful kid, uh, Lulia. She's also a very good girl. Uh, I can show her face too. Uh, she's very decent. She doesn't make so, too much of noise. Uh, she's good. Hi. <laughs> Jai Masi, Lulia. And uh, Brother Amar, uh, the brother who is sitting next to Sister uh, uh, Romi is Amar brother. He's also consecrated. And uh, Sister who is next to Brother Amar, a uh, little bit, uh, can you turn the camera a little bit, that side, sister, towards the mother-in-law? Uh, she is the mother of uh, Brother Gopal. Uh, she is also consecrated. Now, I'd like Brother Amar to introduce uh, yourself. Amar, brother, can you, would you like to speak something about yourself? Okay. Hello, Zemasi. I'm Amar, Amar Anamaga. And my youngest brother, Gopal, and I, I'm older, older one. So, and Mama. I passed great uh, thing, and uh, I'm just working, uh, working uh, at a, a little little shop, which is uh, running uh, you and my wife. And I can this truth um, uh, from Gopal, and uh, I'm very excited to know this, and I'm very thankful to God and Brother Gopal and uh, all of Brother Raju and Asis to. Thank you, Brother Amar. Uh, your mom, she's your mom, no? She's a mother. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is the mother of sister, uh, Brother Gopal and Brother Amar. Uh, she's also consecrated, but she doesn't know to read and write, but she shares the same faith as the rest of others. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, my brother. Thank now, you very much. Very happy to see you both. Thank you. Same Thanks. here. <laughs> okay. Now, next, uh, Brother Joel. Joel, Brother? Yes, Brother. Uh, can you on your video? Sure, Brother. Uh, hello, Brother Jaimasi. Jaimasi, Brother. My name is Joel Mogar. I'm cousin of Brother Gopal. And I pass just 12th grade. And my occup 
occupation is bass guitar teacher to providing online bass class to all over the world. And how I came this good Gopal brother uh, mentor to me and when I heard and my interest uh, is more to more. And then I interest to particularly Gopal and brother Raju and Ashish brother and Gopal brother. And when I this listen, uh, my more and more to learn about uh, knowing the truths. And it was very completely experience to new, new, new for me. And in the future, I will be like to be like brother Raju and brother Asis, like brother Gopal, to preach uh, this same like, uh, to preach this message to for all, if God will uh, provide to me, that's uh, all to knowledge to me and pray for me to understand to better uh, his uh, knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, brother Joel is actually a basic uh, music teacher, brother. He has his YouTube channel, which has got a lot of subscriber. Only Christians. He sings a lot of Christian songs. So he's a good singer, a good asset for the Ecclesia. Uh, thank you, brother Joel. Uh, next, uh, sister Muna. Muna, sister. Yes, brother. Uh, sister, if you don't mind, can you on the video for a few minutes? Yes, brother. Okay, sir, so your audio is not so clear. Okay. How is it okay? Uh, it's okay. A little bit louder. Okay, brother. Ah, okay, now clear. Uh, brother. My name is Muna Silva. Uh, I have completed my bachelor degree. I am brother Gopal's friend. Uh, brother Gopal used to tell me about this truth like every day. Uh, I got answers to some of my doubts and gradually my interest in this truth grew. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm thankful to God uh, for this opportunity to learn about this truth. And uh, I also want to be consecrated in future. So please remember me in your prayers, brother. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Sister. Sister Muna is a very good asset, brother. She does a lot of translation work involving Brother Ashish and Brother uh, Gopal. She supports them. And uh, Gopal has witnessed the truth first to this uh, sister. And she is uh, her classmate, uh, his classmate. So it's good that the Lord has used, been using the brethren to witness uh, the Lord. Uh, so in the end, I would like to... Um, Gopal, brother... Uh, would you like to say any words? Okay, on your video as well. Good evening, brother. Mercy. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining. And uh, we are so happy to see you, brother Rick. And uh, I think uh, it's all... Uh, I don't have to say anything for now, brother. Happy okay. to see you. Please uh, share Thank our you. love uh, to uh, Sister uh, Ruth as well. Thank you. Will do, gladly. Good to see you. Good to see you too, brother. Okay. Thank you, brother. Ashish, brother. Ashish, brother, would you like to speak something, brother? Ah. Uh. I believe you have seen my video and my audio is clear. Oh, excellent. Uh, good evening. Good to see Brother Rick after so long. And particularly, uh, I believe it's not an appropriate uh, time, but uh, as Brother Rick is very hard to reach out, especially accept email. So I think this would be the most appropriate time and season to uh, express this 
particular thought. And we are particularly expecting Brother Rick and Sister Rus in Nepal very soon so that we can meet <laughs> physically. <laughs> that would be uh, nice. Particular, it's, it's because uh, time flees, time flees very soon. And hopefully we'll meet beyond that bill, obviously. But before that, it would be much encouraging to us to meet you physically in Nepal because time is fleeing and even ages of both of you, uh, it's, it's, it's a truth, no matter we need to say. And I'm, praying, I'm personally praying for both of you at proper time, we'll see you in Nepal. And beside uh, myself, I want to say something about Brother Joel this time. Uh, Brother Joel, as he has told, and uh, Brother Razu has explained, beside a music teacher, I, uh, I preferentially try, I preferentially prefer uh, to explain him that he has got an enormous uh, talent in computer. Uh, he, he has a lot of talents in computer. I personally tried and checked some of his works and he is, he is a really talent in computer. I'll share some of his works. Uh, I didn't get that particular uh, thing he has worked on previously. I will share uh, after a while I get it. So I believe uh, brother uh, Joel uh, will be a very useful asset in preparing uh, materials in Nepali. Uh, that's all I want to say. Uh, I believe time is uh, almost gone away, and I would like to hand over this time to Brother Rick and Brother Razu to continue our classes. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Brother Ashish. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Brother Ashish. Uh, as uh, Brother Ashish told, uh, we will all travel together once to the Himalayas, God willing, along with Brother Rick and Sister Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, thanks to everybody for uh, introducing well about yourself. Uh, all glory and praise to God. Uh, all the brethren here are just the channels which the Lord has been using. We're all just uh, the donkeys in his hand whom the Lord is actually sitting over us. So we are all unprofitable and unworthy servants. So whatever God has given us, it is only of his mercy. It is only of his uh, arms that we're living. We thank you for uh, we thank the Lord for everything. Now uh, we'll uh, request Brother Rick to hand over. Uh, I mean, deliver the Lord's message. Uh, Brother Rick, uh, over to you. Uh, probably forty-five minutes should be sufficient. We can share the screen. I made it the cost. Very good. I, I very much appreciate the privilege again. I thank our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ for this lesson and the opportunity to share it. And we thank Brother Raju for his efforts in creating the screen shares, which are very nice and uh, will be very useful. This lesson regarding the two feedings relate to two actual events. But we think they also were given in such a way to teach you and I lessons regarding the plan of God. They are a confirmation of things, truths, that we have already proved from direct scripture. Yet, they confirm what we know, and it causes us to appreciate how the Heavenly Father, in His Holy Word, has hidden beautiful truths, both direct and indirect, for His people to come to understand. The, the two feedings of Jesus, the two feedings of the multitudes, two occasions, they are recorded in such a way that it's undeniable 
that they were meant to teach us symbolic lessons. But we'd like to start with the scriptures that we believe will give us authority to look for a deeper meaning in our Lord's two feedings of the multitudes. So we will start in Matthew chapter 16, and we would like to uh, read verses 1 through 4. Now, I'm not sure what your custom is at your meetings. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Raju, do you generally have a designated scripture reader, or do you speaker speak that? Uh, the brethren here take turns, brother, in reading the scriptures. So you can call out the names, so they will be reading the scriptures. Anybody can call out from the screen, or else uh, I can call it for your for your. So you can let me know. Brother Raju, I'll let you uh, uh, call for scripture readers. And and please feel free to use the screen share. Okay, one minute. Then I'll share the screen. One minute, brother. Okay. Uh, screen is visible to everybody. Is clear? Yes, brother. We are seeing. It's clear. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rick, brother, uh, you can tell me which is the scripture. They will read. I'll tell uh, sit Muna, sister, can you read the scriptures? Okay, brother. Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4, please. One to four, brother. Yes, sister. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, he say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today. For the sky is red and lowering, O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the sign of the time? A wicked and adulterous generation seek it after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Very good. We start here with Jesus being challenged by the religious leaders. They are looking for a sign. However, they are not of the right heart condition. Jesus, in fact, was performing many signs when he would heal, when he would teach when he performed other miracles. And yet, because of their hard-heartedness, their poor attitude, they wanted him to perform some miraculous sign for their approval. Yet Jesus would not reward their proud and haughty spirit. So he tells them that the only sign they would get would be the sign of Jonas. Now, the sign of Jonah was that he was parts of three days in a, the belly of the fish before he was spewed out alive on the shore. And we know that that is a depiction of how Jesus would be parts of three days 
in the grave. He was dead. He went into the grave after 3 p.m. on the day before the Sabbath. He was in the grave the complete day of day two, the Sabbath day. And he was resurrected in the early morning hours on the third day, the morning after the resurrection, when the women and then the apostles, Peter and John, came to the empty tomb. And the women received the message from the angels that he was not there, for he had risen, as he had said. But we want to note that Jesus said the only sign that these hypocritical religious teachers would receive was after it was too late, as it were. They would have already plotted to put him to death, and yet he would be resurrected. And that would be the only sign given to them. Now, it's good for us to note, in this very chapter, we'd like to read Matthew 16 and verse 21. 16, 21. Uh, Sister Romy, can you read, sir? Matthew 16, 21. Okay, brother. From that time, forth began Jesus to sew unto his disciples how that he must go unto the Jerusalem and suffer many things of, of the elders and uh, chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Thank you. Very good. We want to just note that after this exchange with the scribes and Pharisees, that Jesus started to teach and tell his disciples. He prophesied. Jesus was prophesying to them who would plot to put him to death and that he would die, yet he would be raised again. He would be resurrected again on the third day. Now, two important points, brethren. He was not raised on the fourth day. He was raised on the third day, which means he was in the grave parts of three days. And we also like to observe that Jesus prophesied that these hypocrites, scribes and Pharisees, who were challenging him for a sign, because they were hypocritical and he knew their hearts, he knew that they could not receive any sign that he would give them except this, that he would be raised the third day. And as mentioned, it would have been too late for them at that point. But now we'd like to continue in Matthew 16. We'd like to read Matthew 16, verses 5 through 12. 5 through 12. Uh, brother Joel, can you read the verses, brother? Okay, brother. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because where we have taken no bread. Which, when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets 
ye take up neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many basket ye take up to cup how is it that ye do not understand that i speak it not you concerning bread that ye should beware of leaven of the pharisees of the sadducees then understand understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread but of the doctrine of the pharisees of the sadducees the great confession very good thank you so brethren this last verse verse 12 Jesus has made his point, and the disciples finally understand that the bread was symbolic of teaching, teaching the word of God. As you recall, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. However, they understood that Jesus was teaching them that the bread or the doctrine, the teachings of the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, was tainted with leaven. And in the scripture, leaven represents sin. So sinful doctrine is actually error, error, erroneous doctrine. But we notice that this takes place, this exchange of Jesus with his disciples, this exchange takes place after he had fed the two groups of people. And he, Jesus even itemizes some of the aspects of the feedings how many were fed, how many baskets were taken up. So that on one hand, he was teaching them that their faith should be strengthened because of the miracles they saw. But more importantly, their faith should be strengthened that the Lord would give them the necessary truth, the pure unleavened bread of truth, that they could be nourished spiritually in due time. Now, we know they aren't spirit begotten yet because Jesus had to die first, had to be resurrected, had to ascend into heaven to present the merit of his ransom sacrifice to the heavenly father so that then the narrow way, the covenant of grace and sacrifice, to find the bride of Christ, to find the 144,000. That would take place from Pentecost onward. But here, when Jesus was with them, these were the lessons he was trying to impart. So we're going to say from the beginning that these two feedings, the 5,000 people with the five loaves, the 4,000 people with the seven loaves, represent symbolically the two harvests, the harvest of the Jewish age at the first advent when Jesus was with them as Messiah. And the second feeding represents the gospel age harvest, when the Lord would return. So the time of harvest is a time of separating those who would be faithful to the Lord. And the harvest of the Jewish age come at the close of the Jewish age, and looking at this chart of the divine plan of the ages on the screen, we could see that that harvest, our Lord Jesus was present in the flesh. 
on uh, plane N. And then when he was spirit begotten at the age of 30 in 29 AD, he ascended to plane M. He was the only new creature at that time. And then after his three and a half year ministry, he ascended, uh, he died and was resurrected and ascended into Earth's atmosphere, plain L, for 40 days. And he would appear unto the disciples. And then after that 40 days, he ascended into heaven itself, plain K, where he was set down at the right hand of the Father, and he presented the merit of his sacrifice under the Heavenly Father, which then allowed for the day of Pentecost and the beginning of spirit begettal to humans, beginning with the 12, uh, beginning with the 11 apostles in the upper room who received the tongues of fire over their head as an evidence of their spirit begettal. This opens up the gospel age first to the Jews, then in 36 AD to the Gentiles, and that gospel age continued to call and draw both wheat, but also through Satan's efforts of, of uh, confusion, it created tares, so there were wheat and tares growing. But our Lord had said that he would return and when he returns, it's the harvest of the gospel age. And that began in 1874 when our Lord returned. The harvest, the sifting work, began between the wheat and the tares. And eventually, we're very close, we believe, to all the wheat being found, gathered into the heavenly garner to be with our Lord, meet him in the air, Plain L, once again, united to their head, and then together they be glorified to heaven itself. So what we find is that in the first harvest, the Jewish age, and then the second harvest, the end of the gospel age, our Lord Jesus was present both times. The first time he was present in the flesh, and was spirit begotten. The second time he returns as a glorified spirit being and returns to earth's atmosphere where he gathers the saints. So our lesson now is to look at more details regarding these two feedings. So we'd like to read Matthew 14 verses 14 through 21, please. Uh, Brother Gopal, can you read Matthew 14, chapter 14 to 21? Okay, brother. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening. His disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five. We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled and they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men, beside women and children. Very good. Thank you. 
So I'm going to repeat what I said at the beginning. We do think that these miracles actually did happen. But we've learned that we are commissioned or authorized to look for a symbolic lesson for us as new creatures. So this first feeding represented the experiences at the first advent, when Jesus was calling first the Jews who would have faith out from the rest of the Jewish nation, those who did not have true faith. In verse 13, it tells us that Jesus goes to a desert place, and the people came out of the cities to hear him. A city represents an organized religious system. In the, at the first advent, that was the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests. And that was a corrupt system. As Jesus said, they were hypocrites. And they were teaching error. Their bread of, that they were feeding the people had leaven associated with it. But Jesus came out of those religious systems. He was not part of that. In fact, as a man, he was born of the tribe of Judah, the kingly tribe. He was not of the tribe of Levi, so he would not have been of that old Levitical priesthood. Rather, he was starting something new. He was, the people came out from the religious systems of that day to listen to Jesus as a new teacher, even though it seemed like a desert place. The people came to him. He was moved with compassion, verse 14, he was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. Uh, yes, he's the great physician, and we are all sick. We are sick from the effects of sin and death. And all the poor character we have because we inherited sin all the way back to Father Adam. The fathers have eaten the sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. All the way back from when Adam sinned, he has passed on inherited sin to all of his children. So, we all need to be healed from our sin sickness. And you and I have found that healing by coming to the Lord and accepting Him as our Redeemer and accepting that He is our ransomer. He has made atonement. He has brought peace between us and our Heavenly Father. Verse 15, it tells us when it was evening. So it was in the, this day, a particular day, which the people had come, and they stayed to listen to Jesus and to be healed. And they didn't want to leave. And the disciples thought that Jesus should dismiss the crowd because undoubtedly they would be getting hungry and would need to eat. And that they were in a desert place outside of the city, so there would not be markets available for them to purchase their food. But Jesus said, they do not need to depart. You can feed them. And of course, the disciples couldn't understand this. They ask and they find that what they have are five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus says, bring it to me. Then he commanded the people to sit. And when they sit, that represents that they are being submissive to our Lord Jesus, submissive to our Heavenly Father in order to be fed. A proper heart condition. Verse 19 Jesus took the five loaves, two fishes, 
and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break it and gave the loaves to his disciples. And then the disciples gave it to the multitudes. And so, yes, whenever we want to feed on the word of God, his bread, we want to look up and give thanks to the one who has given it to us, the heavenly father, for all we have comes from him. And it is only right that we have an attitude of appreciation and thankfulness that when you and I sit down to feed in the Word of God, to study, we should always pray first and seek His blessing that we would have the enlighten, enlightenment of mind to understand the lesson He would have for us. You and I learn to sit at Jesus' feet to be taught of him, because he is our great advocate with the Heavenly Father on how we can have our relationship together. They all ate. They were all satisfied. And remarkably, the disciples were to gather all the fragments left over, and they gathered up 12 full baskets. And it tells us those that ate were 5,000 men, along with women and children who were not numbered. So that represents that at this first advent, our Lord Jesus amongst the Jewish people, he had sought out those who would have the right attitude of humility recognizing they needed healing from their sin sickness. They would humble themselves at his feet to learn the true word of God, the pure word of God, that they would be filled with, with the good things that God has for them, and then there would be an abundance left over. Now we'd like to read the second feeding found in Matthew 15, and we'd like to read verses 29 through 38, please. Uh, Munan, sister, can you read uh, Matthew 15, chapter 29 to 38? Okay, brother. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there and great multitudes came unto him having with them those that were lame blind dumb maimed and many others and cast them down at jesus feet and he healed them insomuch that the multitude wondered uh, when they saw the dumb to speak the maimed to be whole the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him, and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days, and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, When uh, should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so, uh, so great a multitude? And, and Jesus said unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fishes, and give thanks and break them and give to his disciple and the disciple to the multitude and they did all eat and were filled and they took took up of the broken meat that was left a seven basket full and they uh, and they that did eat were four thousand men beside women and children Very good. Thank you. So this second 
miraculous feeding of the multitudes symbolically represents the got the harvest of the gospel age when our lord returned from 1874 and onward we're still living in that harvest separation period but here we read that in verse 29 jesus came into the uh unto the sea of galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. So a mountain represents a kingdom in Scripture. So when our Lord returned, we are told that he returned as a king. For Jesus had even prophetically said that as a man would journey to a far country to receive his kingdom and return, then he would reward his servants for their conduct during his absence. So our Lord returns as a king to claim his kingdom. And the process begins by him having a harvesting of all who claim to be Christian. He would harvest between the wheat, the faithful Christians, true Christians, spirit-begotten Christians, and the tares, the imitation Christians, only nominally Christian. And this great harvest continues. In verse 30, we read that the great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, Maine, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet to be healed. And Jesus, once again, he calls those to him who humbly recognize not our physical infirmities, which is true, many of us have, but rather our character flaws our character deficiencies because of the effect of Adamic or inherited sin that we all suffer from. And we want to have our, our sinful nature healed. We want to have forgiveness from our sins with the Lord God. And we've learned that the only way to do that is to come through Jesus and accept what he has done for us both his ransom sacrifice, his example, and his teachings. And this is what takes place at the second advent as well. And again, at his feet, at Jesus' feet, is this humility of accepting Jesus' authority. In verse 32, Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. We'll talk about the three days more in a moment. But this shows a distinction from the first feeding that he fed them at the end of the day when it was evening, one day. But here we have that they've been with him three days. Well, we'll talk about that in a moment in more detail. But suffice it to say, it's one of the evidences that we are now talking about the second harvest, the harvest of the, at the end of the gospel age. But we know once again, he's in the mountain. He's outside of the city, and he's calling the multitudes to join him. And so you and I, we have left the nominal churches, churchanity. We have left that city, also known as Babylon. We have left that city condition, and we've gone out into the wilderness area to be with our Lord, to be taught of him. We've learned that you don't need a church building. 
You don't need a church denomination. You do not need man-made appointed priests or ministers. What we need is our relationship with the Heavenly Father through our Lord Jesus, and that is our authority to understand that we are now the sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father, and we can call him Father. But we had to leave the cities of the nominal churches to be with our Lord in the wilderness condition, and he will provide for us. And here we find that they were fasting, and they were desirous to have his feeding. And they bring to him seven loaves of bread. And in verse 34, it says, a few little fishes. But in verse 36, in the Sinaitic manuscript, a, a Greek manuscript that dates back to the 300s AD, very early, it says it was two fish. So we accept that, that there are seven loaves and two fish. And with it, once again, the people sat on the ground. Jesus looks up to heaven. He thanks the Father for the bread, and he breaks it. And then it's dispensed through the disciples to the people. And it tells us that 4,000 men, besides the women and children, were all filled, and that seven baskets full were taken up. So now we have the overarching lesson of these two feedings. So then we ask ourselves that the Lord, in both Advents, he healed all the sick. Yes, all were, all of us, have been cured of sin sickness in that Jesus is our Redeemer and gives us a standing with the Heavenly Father and our vows of consecration has allowed us to be spirit begotten and we are now new creatures in Christ Jesus in the eyes of the Heavenly Father. Our sinful nature, our sinful actions are covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness. And the Heavenly Father works with you and works with me based upon our heart intentions, our heart intentions, because they can always be pure. And he appreciates our efforts at trying to act aright, speak aright, and think aright. And that's what he appreciates, our efforts to do right. But we have the number of loaves, the number of fishes. We see that we have the baskets were numbered, 12 at the first, 7 at the second. We have the number of men, 5,000 at the first, 4,000 at the second, and where they had been fed outside the city. So let's put that together now. At the first advent, we had two fish and five loaves, the second advent, two fish, and seven loaves. We had a total of four fish and 12 loaves. And when we add that together, four plus 12 equals 16 units of food. 16 units of food altogether. Four plus 12 is our 16. So then, how many men were fed? 5,000 men at the first advent, 4,000 men at the second advent, for a total of 9,000 men are numbered besides the women and children. So if we take 16 units of food that have been provided, multiply it by the 9,000 men that were fed full, we come up with 144,000. 
This is a number that we have in Revelation, the seventh chapter, and in Revelation, the 14th chapter. So we're going to choose one of those verses to read. Let's read Revelation 14, and it's going to be verses 1. Amar, brother, can you read uh, Revelation 14, 1, brother? One, one through three, please. One through three. Revelation 14, chapter, verses one to three. Amar, brother. And I look, and lo, a lamb stood and the mount sinner, and with him and hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads and i heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many uh, waters and as the voice of a great thunders and i heard the voice of harpers uh, harping with their harps and this the song as it were a new song before the throne and before the before the four beats and the pillars and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and uh, and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth very good so, thank you. We won't spend time here, but we wanted to make the simple observation that the grand harvesting of the gospel age from the first advent harvest of the Jewish nation all the way through to the end of the gospel age with the harvesting of all that claimed to be Christian, the Lord was seeking 144,000 that would be developed into the Christ-like character of his son, and that these would be the ones granted immortality with Jesus, and together they would have the Father's name written in their foreheads, the Heavenly Father's name. They're part of the divine family that God, who alone had the divine nature, immortality, until Jesus was rewarded with immortality upon his resurrection as a faithful new creature. And then the 144,000 received the same gift, reward of immortality and the divine nature. And their special divine family relationship, which is only being offered now in this gospel age for which you and I are running the race to be found faithful unto death, that we might receive that crown of life and be with our Lord Jesus and serve our Heavenly Father for all eternity. But here's our number the 144,000. How remarkable, how remarkable that in these two literal feed, feedings that Jesus miraculously did, it incorporated the symbolic lessons hidden from the wise, but revealed unto us, the babes, those who through humility of mind and heart through searching out the plan of God, have learned that the pure, unleavened bread of truth that we have been fed by our present Lord at the first advent and at the second advent is what allows you and I to be outside of the churches, outside of the nominal churches and, their, and that nominal spirit to be developed in a life of true holiness. Now, we're told 
that women and children also ate and how true it is. Why was the men numbered? Well, brother, and I want to assure you that there are men and women in the 144,000. And I want to look at a verse to help prove that so that no one misunderstands symbolic language. We'd like to read in Galatians, the third chapter, Galatians 3. Oh, Galatians 3 and verses uh, 26 and 20 through 29. 26 to 29, please. Uh, Robin, sister, can you read Galatians 6, uh, 23 to 29? Okay, brother. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you ha as have been baptized unto Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew or nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male or nor female. For ye are all one in Jesus, Christ Jesus. And if ye be the Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and here's according to the promise. Okay, thank you. The Apostle Paul is clearly writing that those who've responded to the high calling and have consecrated to the Heavenly Father and have been spirit begotten as new creatures. That's what the word Christ means. The Greek word um, Christos means anointed. And so the anointing is with the oil of the Holy Spirit, symbolic oil of the Holy Spirit. That it doesn't matter if we were Gentiles or Jews doesn't matter if we're male or female, doesn't matter if we were slaves or if we're free men. If we are spirit begotten, we all have an equal standing with God. Now, brothers and sisters have different roles in the church. That's true. That's explained elsewhere. But regardless of one's roles, in the church, our relationship is equal in the eyes of the Heavenly Father. And that will be true in the 144,000. It will be made up of those who had been men, had been women, but had been spirit begotten. So why then this lesson in the two feedings? Why were the men numbered? Because men in the scriptures represent strength, and it shows the strength of the 144,000 to go unto Jesus outside of the nominal churches and to be taught of him. And they properly receive the bread that, that he feeds them. The women might represent those who are represented of uh, the great company and as well as the children. Those who are weaker in faith didn't properly develop in the same. It's just a symbol. The reality is we have sisters who can be every bit as strong and stronger than some of the brothers regarding their faith and faithfulness. So this is just a symbolic lesson. All right, let's look at the baskets of food left over. At the first advent, it tells us 12 baskets of the pieces of bread that Jesus used to feed the people had been left over or gathered up. So it represents that the 12 apostles were used after the first advent throughout the gospel age to teach us the truths that Jesus had left and that they were responsible for writing the New Testament for us. But at the second advent, we learn that there have been seven baskets or pieces left over. And it seems to say to us that the Lord had used seven messengers, seven angels, to the seven stages of the church throughout the gospel age. Now, it's true 
these seven messengers to the church had come during the gospel age. But it uh, seems to denote that when our Lord returns at the end of the gospel age, during the time of the seventh church, Laodicea, the time of the seventh messenger, uh, our brother Russell, that it's just a way of indicating from the lesson that we had the apostles had to come first, and then we have our, our messengers. But even there, let me say, we think our first two messengers were two apostles, uh, P, uh, Paul and John. But let us stay focused on our, our lesson at hand and look to at the, the places. At the first advent, it was a desert place in one day. That's outside the Jewish synagogues and the Jewish corrupt teachers. At the second advent, the place was a mountain showing that our Lord returns and, and establishes, starts setting up his kingdom, returns as a king with his kingdom. This, too, gives us authority to interpret these two feedings as being symbolic of showing the time that would pass for the complete 144,000 to be developed and to be tested. In both cases, Jesus was feeding uh, those of his followers. But then we have another lesson of interest to us. When we'd like to read in Matthew, and um, it is going to be Matthew, the ninth chapter, Matthew 9. And we'd like to read a verse uh, 14 and 15, please. Uh, but Joel, can you read with her? Matthew 9, 14 and 15. Then, then came to him the disciple of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciple fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bread chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom bridegroom is with them? But they days, but the but the days will come when the bridegroom be shall shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Thank you. Very good. So. Jesus' disciples were not fasting to the same degree that John the Baptist's disciples were. And so they came to Jesus, and they were asking him, challenging him, how come your disciples don't fast as often as John the Baptist's disciples? And Jesus goes on to say that when the bridegroom is with them, they do not fast. So he is our bridegroom. And he's symbolically saying that when he was present at the first advent as the bridegroom, that his disciples, his future bride, wouldn't need to fast. He would feed them spiritual food. But the time would come when the bridegroom would be taken away, and that's true. When our, when our Lord Jesus ascended up into heaven, he was gone through the majority of the gospel age. He was in heaven. And so we were fasting. But upon his return in 1874, the bridegroom returns to gather his bride. But he has to finish harvesting the wheat from the tear to find the final members of the 144,000. But once again, he's feeding his future bride with the unleavened bread of the truth. We call it the harvest message now. And our Lord Jesus would provide a messenger to give, he would give the meat 
the bread in due season, and that messenger, as a fellow servant, would feed the other servants. And so Brother Russell was that servant, and we have been being fed the, the present truth that our return Lord wanted us to have so that we could sit with Jesus and we could feed with him and he would sup with us. It is showing a beautiful relationship between those desirous to being the bride of Christ, being fed by the returned Lord, so that you and I are so blessed to have the understanding that thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of Christians before us during the Dark Ages, when the papacy ruled during the so-called Holy Roman Empire period, they were in darkness, quite often not even having the Bible, certainly having very little truth. But yet, some few persevered during those dark times. But now, you and I, we have Bibles. We have the means to study. We have the harvest message to understand God's true character and to understand Jesus' true character and the privileges we now have. But the three days journey, the three days, a, a, the day can represent a thousand years. You recall Peter said, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like unto a day. So one of the methods of understanding a thousand year day is that we have 6,000 years of sin. That's the work week of laboring under sin from when Adam uh, from when Adam was created in for, he was created in 4129 in October BC. His first full year was 4128 BC which would bring us down 7,000, uh, 6,000 years later would bring us to 1872 BC. But Adam sinned two years after he had been created and Eve had been created. That would have been 4,126 BC. So we had 6,000 years of sin and death ending in 1874 A.D. So the thought is that now, since our Lord returned with his kingdom, he's gradually in phases setting up his kingdom. And the first aspects of the process of removing sin is he has to complete his bride. And he's doing that with the harvest message and with his harvest workers, co-laborers in the harvest. And that's what you and I are, in, are engaged in now. So we have a 6,000 years ending in 1874 to be followed by a 1,000-year millennium, during which time there would be a peaceable kingdom portion, during which time uh, the Lord would be present. But what we find is that we have three 1,000-year days from the first advent, when our Lord appeared in, eight, uh, in uh, 33 AD. Then it continues down a 1,000 years, then a second 1,000 years, and then at the beginning, early in the seventh 1,000-year period, we find ourselves in that third day from the first advent. So the second advent is parts of three 1,000-year days from the first advent. I'll let that settle for a moment. The, the second advent pictured by this second feeding, is on the third day. 
So there have been parts of three days, part of the fifth 1,000 years, all of the sixth 1,000 years, second day, and the beginning or part of the third 1,000 year day, the seventh 1,000 year. Uh, brethren, think on that. But I think it's a very powerful lesson in assisting us to understanding how wonderful, marvelous, really amazing, the lessons, the symbolic lessons that our Heavenly Father through our Lord Jesus desired for us to recognize at this time of how we have a confirmation of what the Lord and how the Lord is providing for our every spiritual need. With that, uh, we conclude this lesson. Thank you, Brother Rick, uh, for sharing the Lord's uh, discourse with uh, Brethren. So we thank the Lord for giving us a, a wonderful uh, a subject. And uh, Brother Gopal would be doing the same subject in Nepali on the coming Saturday for the Brethren to understand more detail uh, intricately in their own language. Uh, if any brethren uh, have any doubts or any questions regarding the subject or any other subject, uh, if you want to discuss or uh, ask him any questions, uh, they are free to ask anybody. Brother uh, Gopal, Brother Joel, uh, Sister Muna, Sister uh, Romi or Brother Amar, even Brother Ashish also. Anybody? Any doubts? Uh, any questions? Brother... Brother Raju and Brother Rick, uh, I would be representing all of them, uh, probably. So they might have this question as well. So as a representative, I just want to uh, confirm, because I have read this chapter a long time back, and many of the aspects I revised today. And uh, regarding the feces, uh, in uh, second feeding, uh, is there any basis that we could number it to, like two fishes? Because uh, in both the verses, Matthew 15, uh, 34, and Mark 8 chapter, it uh, clearly says a uh, few little fishes. So it would be so kind of you, both, if you basis, how could you number it to? Well, that is a question that we all ask, and it's a good question, because <laughs> we want to be faithful to the Word of God. And it's true that in Matthew 15, 34, it says, a few little fishes. And that's true in the Greek. However, in the Sinaitic Manuscript, from about 350, 325 AD, very old manuscript. It has in verse 36 only that it's two fish. Clearly it states two fish. Now the Sinaitic manuscript, uh, yeah, I tr you can look this up online a little background, that manuscript was found it, uh, after several visits by a mis mis Mr. Tischendorf that he made to the St. Catherine's Cath um, Monastery that's at the foot of Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula back in the late 1800s. And he was staying there as a guest at the monastery and found in a waste paper basket, a trash basket, a number of pages of an ancient Greek manuscript 
that he recognized as being extremely old. He made a later trip and recovered the rest of the pages. And it's called the Sinaitic Manuscript because it was found in a monastery at the foot of St. Catherine's Monastery. And the only way the monks of that monastery would part with it is they made it a gift to the Tsar of Russia. The Tsar of Russia was giving financial support to the monks at that St. Catherine's Monastery. However, without any further history, that manuscript is in the British Museum the British Library. I've seen it. They have it under protective glass, but I have seen it. It's been all translated into English and other languages. You can find it online and you can look this up and you can look at the Greek word and you can translate it into the proper English. But it's, it's indisputable that that manuscript has two fishes. Whether or not someone wants to accept that manuscript, that's their choice. But it's one of the oldest and one of the best. <laughs> Over. Brother Raju, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I think that's very quite clear, brother. Because uh, from earlier, the, uh, the first time when you took the subject in India, uh, you clarified that one. So that's okay. It's not an issue. Uh, we had the same doubt. So the clarification is quite uh, clear, brother. Uh, anything else, uh, Ashish? Brother? Any more questions, brother? Let me check with them because they might be quite hesitating to ask the question. Let me check with them in Nepali. Okay. Uh, um, sister Romira, Amar brother, kya icha? Ona to tapa lagar ba. Samay li bujhe su, na? Suru me ali kiti gar hunda. Business gari two feeding, doi ta is song related ba. Karne ka to ali gar hunda chhau nahi. Tei pani yo bahe aur upai lagu kuni, atwa yo. यस्तो <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> So the the Rick and brother Raju, they are uh, they have understood quite a bit, and it's very uh, new topic. And as per them, it is entirely the entirely new, uh, very new interpretation for them, and they are quite happy. Uh, that's all they are. They have it to say, and they need to revise it again. Uh, we'll revise it on Saturday. Uh, and thank you so much for your valuable time, brother Rick. Let me say this about that to, to think about till Saturday. 
I understand how it takes some time to, to, to sink in. I'm going to give you four, five points to think about. Five points. Okay. What if there was one man different? Not 5,000, but 4,999 men. It wouldn't work. What if there was one man more? 4,001 plus 5,000. The math wouldn't work. What if there is one different loaf of bread or a different number of fish? The math wouldn't work. What if the desert was mentioned at the second feeding and the mountain at the first feeding? It wouldn't work. What if the three days fasting was said at the first feeding? It wouldn't work. What if the 12 baskets were taken up at the second feeding and the seven baskets were taken up at the first feeding? It wouldn't work. So, five points that if it was different, even by one man or one loaf of bread or one fish, more or less, none of it would work. But because it's so particular on how it was laid out and how in Matthew's gospel, we have chapter 14 with the feeding, chapter 15 with the second feeding, then chapter 16 with the very lesson in which Jesus brings to the disciples' mind to look for a symbolic understanding of those feedings and he names them, and how it represents pure bread versus the leavened bread of the doctrine of the Pharisees. So we are drawing these conclusions, suggesting them, because of all these powerful indicators. But let's be clear, it doesn't teach any new doctrine. It doesn't teach anything that we don't have direct scripture that we've already proved. 144,000 saints, that there are two advents, that when the Lord is present, he feeds his people, that there would be a long fasting time between his presences. So I just leave you with those, what we, we say here, Food for thought, that's not a pun, but food for thought on uh, your discussions for next week. Over. Noted, brother. Okay, we have noted. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Rick. So in the end, uh, to conclude the service, uh, Brother Joel would like to uh, sing a small song. Uh, Brother Joel, over to you. Then in the end, oh, we'll uh, finish okay. with a word of prayer. Uh, I request with Rick to offer a prayer, last prayer after the song. Thank you. Okay, I will sing uh, some chorus. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah.
Thank you, brother. Uh, now I request Brother Rick uh, to offer uh, the prayers uh, and bless the Ecclesia and bless the brethren so they may also grow into Christ likeness. Thank you, brother. Over to you. Thank you, Brother Joel, for your lovely song. Beloved Heavenly Father, we come into thy sacred presence through the blood and merit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we have this privilege to call thee, Father. We are thankful to have a resurrected and glorified Lord whom you've even sent back for us. Dear Father, we thank thee for thy word of truth. We thank thee for the inspiration it has given us in our lives. We thank thee for all the healing you've done in our hearts and minds. And we thank thee for the strength for each day. And now, dear Father, we do thank thee for this lesson that you have hidden in thy word to be revealed in due time at the end of this age. We do thank thee for this privilege of being together as thy people from Nepal and India and the US. We are very grateful that you've given us the technology that we could meet and worship together and to have this fellowship uh, through Christ Jesus. And we ask dear father that you would bless uh, that these dear ones in Nepal we are so grateful, and so many brethren around the world rejoice in knowing that you have worked mightily there. We especially appreciate these early efforts of Brother Ashish in finding the truth and making it his own, Brother Gopal learning, and then Brother Gopal sharing it with the others. And may each and all be of humble heart, recognizing that it's all by thy grace and all through the merit of dear Jesus. But help us, one and all, together and in our own individual lives, to render glory to you and to honor thee and to make use of what talents you've given each of us to, to, to uh, be profitable servants before thee. And now, dear Father, we uh, uh, also want to especially thank you for Brother Raju and his family and his commitment to service to thee and all the things he suffers uh, for thy name's sake. We pray that you would be with them, help them, and continue this blessing of his efforts with our brethren in, uh, in Nepal. And we pray your blessing on the translation work so that that which is in English and other languages can, can be found in the Nepalese language uh, for those uh, who will be even and more interested when they can read it in their first language and help their understanding. So, Father, we leave it all with thee. We love you and, and we praise you. We thank you for Jesus. We ask your overruling, and, but we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, Brother Raju, ah. uh, just for your kind permission, I believe we have missed uh, Brother Joel's mother. Joel's uh, mother. Yeah. Okay. Joel, uh, okay. Uh, she's uh, there. So so Joel, your mom is there. So this is Yeah. Okay. She had already slept. Okay. Sorry. She slept. Okay. Okay then. Thank you, everybody. God bless, brother. God bless. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye, Ramister. Thank you, brother. Bye, brother. Bye, brother. Ashish, brother. Bye, everybody. Bye, brother. Bye. 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 Bye.